banter. I am Elizaveta, and I'm very happy to be with you here today on our third episode this month having to do with the theme of practice. And today I'm going to be talking about specifically what and how you should be, could be practicing tango. We're going to talk about how I practice tango and hopefully uh, at the end of the episode you'll have a lot of ideas and tools under your belt to figure out what sort of practice would be best for you. Now at the time of this recording I am freshly back from Line Trega Marathon in New York. And I got to meet quite a few of my listeners and it was such a thrill uh, to meet people face to face. And uh, one person kept repeating, I know more about you than you know about me. (laughs) And I thought, yeah, that's true. If you've been listening to this podcast since the start, you know quite a bit about me. And I learned a lot about myself uh, this weekend, this past weekend. And I got to say, I'm feeling a little bit of that post-marathon slump. And I am going to be thinking a little bit about what that really is. And I am thinking next month, actually, to dedicate... A whole month to talking about marathons and festivals and just sort of all of the aspects of doing this kind of thing physical emotional and so so that's something to look forward to I uh, invite you to send me some of your nuggets of wisdom and insights if you have any about your experience at at uh, marathons and festivals and uh, do you like them which one do you prefer and why Uh, so questions like that so I invite some some ideas for us to explore and the other thing that's sort of kind of related but kind of not I just wanted to mention how much I appreciated in this event, what they did for the wristbands. Now, if you've ever been to any festival marathon, wristbands is a very common way that organizers keep track of what kind of passes people have and whether they have a pass or not. But typically it's those plastic wristbands that uh, sort of clip on the wrist and you can't undo it unless you break it and in that way we're sort of forced to wear this thing for three days and I don't know about you but I really dislike them because I really really don't like them having them on when I shower like there's something just really annoying about it and there was only there's only one other event that I've ever attended that did something different. And Line Trega is the second event. And um, if you're watching uh, this podcast episode, I'm uh, sort of showing the the wristband, and it's just this very simple sort of woven string bracelet with a little half of a yin yang symbol in the middle. And I really love it, first of all, because I could take it off. As I said, I don't like having things on my wrist when I take a shower. I want to have that ability to take it off. Plus, a lot of times, those plastic ones, they really don't go with the outfit, you know? Like, they really stand out. You have, 
might be having this like beautiful dress on, your hair is all done, and then there's this like bright yellow or green or orange plastic piece on your wrist, you know, and it's just like, ugh. Um, so I like the fact that you can take it off and on, but also this is one of those kinds of wristbands that I would want to keep, you know, and I, I see myself wearing this and I, I really loved how there was this thought put into the yin and yang because you could take, you know, a wristband from your partner's wrist and match it up and it makes a full yin and yang. And it was just like, oh, how cute. So I, I really appreciated that detail um, and it was something I wanted to share because I, I hope we see more of that. It, it sort of is this little detail that just levels up the event for me um, in this really nice way. So, okay, I'm going to set that aside. Um, if you have any thoughts on the wristband situation or uh, if you have some other varieties of wristbands you've experienced, let me know. Uh, it's something I, I like to think about uh, in my spare time. So, okay, we're going to launch into this discussion about practice. And I, I'm right away going to admit to you that I'm about as lazy as it gets when it comes to practicing. And so if, if you're listening to this and you disagree with everything I say, uh, it's probably because you're not as lazy as I am. <laughs> uh, I fully admit it. And it took me a long time to admit this to myself. I, on top of being lazy, I get bored very easily. So it's tricky for me to keep my attention focused. It's, it's really amazing to me that I've even achieved as much as I have because of the level of... Um, disinterest that I can experience towards something. So I come to you from a place of really having to figure out how to, how to do the minimum and get the maximum. You know, I'm always about that. How can I do less and get more? <laughs> I realize fully that, um, my particular style and my philosophy on this matter will be very different from others. So, speaking from a place of extreme laziness and easy boredom, I, over the years, had to come up with ways to keep myself interested. My first experience experiences with practice, with practicing with people, it was a lot of like trial and error. You know, I would try it one way. I tried another way. I always thought that I really didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, when I was a follower, it was kind of easy because I could just, I could just rely on the leader to do what they're doing. So I had a number of leader partners uh, for practice and I would just show up and whatever they wanted to do, I was like, yeah, whatever. But then when I started leading and I started partnering with followers, followers were looking to me to know what to do. And so then I was like, well, what do I, what do I do? How do I, how do I make it work for myself? Because there's a lot of things that I didn't really care to do. I'm horrible at remembering vocabulary. I'm like really bad at it. Um, choreography, those kinds of things. I just, I don't do well. That's not my strength. So I went through a process of trial and error and eventually arrived at a method that keeps me engaged. So I'm emphasizing that because... I'm certain that all of us are very different. In fact, I say that tinker dancers are like cats. You know, we're just super temperamental. Uh, we have our little finicky things. We're just 
you know, we like things this way and not that way. And um, so we can't just have like a one size fits all. Uh, that's why when I hear a lot of criticism about, you know, dancers are not practicing, They're, they should be practicing, you're not, you're not being a responsible dancer if you're not putting in the time towards practice and all that. But it's like, how do you know they're not practicing? We all, we're all different. We all practice different things. We all have different agendas. Uh, so I think it's, it has to be specific to you, you know. So I'm just sharing that. I felt that way. I felt that I was an oddball because I, you know, at some point decided that I just didn't want to go to any more technique classes and drill in front of a mirror. Like I was, I had done so much of it and it just felt like it wasn't really leading anywhere. I wasn't improving anything except moving better in front of a mirror perhaps, but whatever. So I, I kind of got to this place where I felt there was something wrong with me. Like, like I'm broken in, on the inside. I can't, I, I don't like practicing. And I don't like doing this stuff and other people do. And if I, if I was a real tango dancer, I'd be doing that. So I, I did go through that and I had to, you know, I talked to on other episodes about that, that I had to just sort of accept my failure and like accept that, okay, I wasn't a real tango dancer, which then freed my mental energy up because I was like, well, I'm not a real tango dancer anyway, so I can just do whatever the hell I want. <laughs> and, you know, if I look way, way back, I remember being at a, uh, a small marathon in Oregon one year and there was a group discussion this is the only event that I've ever been to like this there was a group discussion among women it was a women's gathering and for about an hour and a half there was a general discussion about tango and getting better at tango and practicing and what to practice and I like everyone else was in this place of complete just blankness in terms of like knowing what to practice. I was so sort of lost, you know, and I was looking to other people to sort of tell me, you know, do <laughs> like, I think I was waiting for something like a, a priest, you know, who Catholic priest who tells you how many Hail Marys to do. Like I wanted that. I wanted somebody to tell me like, do 12 ochos and three boleos on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and do your whatever on Tuesday, Thursday. So I listened to one teacher speak about her practice and her uh, approach to her practice time. And she was giving us the step-by-step -step of what she was doing. And I don't remember all of the steps that she gave us. I just remember <laughs> somewhat shrinking inside myself because I was like, I, I can't do any of that. <laughs> Cause she was saying like, you pick a song and then you break down the song and you, you dance this part of the song and then you dance this other part of the song and then you put it all together. And it was just, there were just like so many details to this. And I just, I just felt so overwhelmed. So again, I'm emphasizing that like, if you ever feel somewhat, uh, of an outlier when it comes to practicing and having a, this rejection or resistance to the conventional models of practice that exist in tango right now. You're not alone. Okay. I I'm sure I'm not the only one. You're not the only one. I think this is evidence, not of the fact that some of us are just behind or lacking in something. I think it's evidence of there needing to be a wider definition of practice or more possibilities of 
what it is we're practicing. So flashing forward now, I have gone through a lot of different variations of uh, approaches towards practice. And I'll tell you what I do now and why I have chosen to do these things over others. And so you might be inspired to try this approach. Uh, and if you do, I would totally welcome your feedback and letting me know how it works out for you. So the number one component of every practice session that I have is that there is significant portion of that time, half at least, if not 80% is dedicated to just dancing. Okay. Just dancing, dancing in such a way that it allows me to experience more than what I experience on the social dance floor. So to me, that time in the practice, it's not like I'm trying to hone movements for the social dance floor, which I know for some people, that's kind of the goal. The goal is to get the move so that you can do it socially at the milonga. I kind of had to flip that for myself and realize that the practice time is special because you're just with your partner. There's nobody else. And it's kind of the equivalent in tango to uh, dancing like nobody's watching, <laughs> you know, that idea. We have that cliche saying, right? Dance like nobody's watching. That's a special state of mind. And this is the equivalent in tango. It's your time to dance with somebody without distractions around. So a lot of my time is spent on that. Now, at the same time that I'm just dancing and I'm just connecting to the music and experimenting, I tend to make videos. And so some of them you've seen on my social media, but I have a little setup, which I'm happy to share with you. If you're curious, I bought a little auto tracker, which is a, this little device that tracks my movement and I use my phone uh, with the camera. And so as I dance, the camera moves with me so that I'm not out of camera shot. And that's been really useful. So I just make videos and within that, within that idea of making videos, I've been experimenting with different uh, modes of making videos. So sometimes I use uh, different filters in the social media apps like Instagram. I'll use a filter where it will play the song at half speed when I record it so that when the video, the finished video plays at full speed, it kind of distorts the movement. I don't know if this makes sense as I describe it, but basically playing with the, with the audio and sometimes playing the audio half speed or double speed and just exploring what that does. So that's been part of my creative outlet because sometimes we think of tango as just the movement. We think of it as like, oh, this is, this is a tango move and that tango move. And I put them together. I dance them to this music, but you know, tango is just an entrance into something. And to me, within practice, it be, it's become kind of fun to follow my own curiosity uh, and to just allow for some sort of experiments to happen. So in my case, it's been with video, but I've heard of other dancers who experiment with dancing with paint on their feet, or they'll do experiments of you know, dancing with their eyes, both partners eyes closed, uh, or dancing in the dark, or, you know, you can come up with your own versions of this, of something that sparks your curiosity. And that's basically what you're investigating. So you start with the place of like, I'm just dancing, this is just play. And then there will be something that will grab your attention and, and pull you in a certain direction based on your interests. 
So for me, it's this idea of capturing tango on video in these weird and strange ways. And then a big part of my process is to actually watch the videos. Now, I know that when you heard that, some of you cringed. <laughs> it is an awful feeling at first. If you're not used to it, to look at yourself when you dance, it's, it feels so embarrassing. And you just want to crawl out of your skin. I absolutely relate to this feeling. I felt that, felt that for a long time, but it is worthwhile to just face that dragon because when it comes to getting a huge return on your investment, the two minutes of video that you might see of yourself is worth hours and hours and hours of instruction. It's so often that we might be doing something and we're seeking instruction from someone, someone to correct us, telling us, you know, tell us what we're doing wrong so we can fix it. But I would argue that for many of us, if we just saw ourselves like visually recorded with our eyes, what it looks like when we're doing something, we actually learn much faster. And I've observed this with my students as well, that making videos every session, making a video at the beginning and at the end, and then creating a library of videos and then going back and seeing those first videos and comparing them to the more current, it's, it's really phenomenal because then you actually see the progression and you can much quicker catch different little blind spots and habits. Like for me, it's been my habit of holding my head forward a little bit. I fervently believe when I dance that my head is not forward. Like I fully have this intention of not having my head forward. But a lot of times when I look at my videos, I'm like, wow, there it is. My head is forward. And so as much as it irks me to see that and as angry as it makes me, I'm grateful to be able to see that because then I have that reference point and it's very easy then to correct it over time. So I highly recommend uh, that you utilize that. And I'll give you another trick that I use frequently. And this has been a real game changer for me in terms of my growth as a dancer. What I started doing is watching a performance by a dancer that I really like. And I would watch the performance at quarter speed. And then right after I would watch a video of myself also at quarter speed. And this side-by-side -side visualization in slow motion of movement was a real game changer for me. Like I said, it really honed my focus and gave me sort of a, a tool to track my progress because eventually what I was seeing in the performance in terms of mechanics and what I was seeing in myself began to get closer and closer. Whereas at the beginning it was like, oh, can't even, can't even look at myself. So these three main components are basically what make up my practice time. I dance a lot. I make videos of my dancing and then I watch those videos. <laughs> and that's basically what I do. Now, I want to touch briefly on frequency of practice because this is another one of those areas that you might believe and have judgment about the amount of practice you're supposed to do in order to get better. Some people might say you must practice every day. If you practice every day, five minutes a day, you're going to get better much quicker than if you just practice once a week. You know, there's different ways that you can put value on a certain time, but I'll just tell you what it's like for me 
being probably the laziest person that exists. <laughs> and so maybe anything above what I do, you're, you're perhaps overachieving. Okay. Um, but the revelation that I had is that it's not necessarily the case that more practice gives you more progress. Okay. In fact, I think any amount of practice can give you progress, provided that it's the kind of practice that really, really inspires you and that gives you a lot of enjoyment. Even if you do that once a week, it will have a profound effect on your dance. So for me, I practice uh, probably once a week at the most my practice time with my partner. Sometimes it's every other week and it's usually for about three hours, sometimes four. Sometimes half of that is taken up by talking. So again, pretty lazy there. Uh, but I've noticed that just because I don't practice in this formal way every day, there's kind of a spectrum that you can you can apply to the idea of practice. There's the practice that's like really focused and intense. And then there's other forms of practice that you can kind of weave into your life, into your daily life without them being something that is, you know, you have to really schedule for. And so for me, I do have daily practice of different kinds that is important. So there's usually some sort of a movement practice. So even though I'm not dancing tango, perhaps, I am still practicing. I'm practicing yoga. I'm practicing different types of movement. I'm practicing dancing because I just love dancing. So, you know, anytime I'm in the kitchen and I'm cooking and a really good song comes on and I bust out some moves, that's practice. That's me putting in some time to practice moving to music. So that counts. Um, another form of practice for me is just listening to the music. So I typically will pick a theme of some kind. Maybe I'll listen to an album by one orchestra because I'm just curious about Troilo these days. Or it will be a thematic, some sort of a thematic playlist like all of Milanguero style or all of Guardia Vieja style. So I'll go on a walk and I'll listen to that music and I'll just imagine. I'll imagine different things. Maybe I'll hear something new in the music and I'll imagine a certain move. That's another form of practice for me. And it's just something that is just there, sort of underlying the whole process. The other form of practice for me is actually looking on stuff at, on social media. Um, I know that social media has a very, very sketchy reputation. <laughs> There's a lot of negativity and a lot of ways that you can get s soaked in and lose your, lose your reality to it. But for me, social media has been a great way to discover uh, new talented people around the world who are doing interesting things. So I have found some inspiring tango dancers on TikTok who put up uh, little videos from their classes and they'll, um, you know, everybody specializes in something different. So uh, I found, you know, teachers who break down things a certain way that's really interesting and then some other teachers who do something else in a very interesting way. And, and all of that just kind of helps me to stay engaged and to um, stay curious and, and learn about new things. And again, that's, that's a form of practice. It's not something that I plan for, but it's something that I invite whenever I have the opportunity to, for that. Okay. So for you, you might want to think about where is this time during the week that you can create almost like a, a sacred studio time where you push yourself into new realms of expression and experience. And then think about other forms of practice that 
are interesting to you that you really enjoy that can be peppered in throughout your day uh, and throughout your time when you don't have a dedicated uh, time for for practicing with a partner and whichever you choose there's no right or wrong so I'm sure some of you will like well is it better to practice this many days at this time or this many times a day or you know you might have like these specifics and honestly I would recommend just start somewhere because it's never gonna feel uh, like you're ready like you have it figured out you might rely on somebody to you know prescribe this to you but if you're like me (laughs) and you get bored really easily then if somebody prescribes you something and you don't like it you're very likely not to continue it so you might as well just kind of try something and then questions will come up and if you have specific questions about practice strategies or tools or you know, feedback, feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to, to chat with you about that because, um, you know, it's an important aspect of our development, of our creative development, and I want to make sure that we support each other in this process. So to finish, I wrote this down in my notes that ultimately whenever we're practicing whether it's the dedicated time frame of practicing with someone for three hours every week or it's practicing of certain elements, you know, practicing listening to music or watching performance videos, watching uh, instruction on tango. What ultimately we're after is we're practicing what I call the tango state of mind. That's what we're really after. We're really after experiencing more and more of that tango state of mind the way meditation is has that same goal you know when we're practicing meditation we're just practicing being in a state of meditation there's not a somewhere where we're going to arrive at a destination meditation just continues being this process of meditation and in this way tango is a state of mind that we practice every time we do something towards developing ourselves as dancers whatever that activity might be so this tango state of mind is available to us in different ways and what makes us unique and special as dancers is that each of us has their own path into that state of mind The goal for all of us is to spend as much time in that state of mind, to practice that state of mind as much as possible. Because the more we get adept at it, the easier it is for us to be in it for longer periods of time. That's what I believe. (laughs) So I am curious what sorts of insights you might have gotten from this episode and if there are other ideas you want to share on the topic of practice. We're going to continue our discussion of practice next week and I hope you join me. It will be a juicy topic on all the do's and don'ts of uh, practicing with another person. I'm sure all of you have experienced a variety and a full spectrum of what that means. So join me next week. Until then, have a great rest of your week and I'll see you later. Ciao.